Turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Thankful to be in the service again. We're thankful to see each one that's here. Matthew 22. If you're here and visiting with us this morning, we thank you for coming. Thank you for being in the service with us. Matthew chapter 22. I want to begin reading in the first verse. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. If you look back to chapter about chapter 21 forward, you're looking at Jesus walks in and or rides in to Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 21, uh, which is the, kind of the famous day in Jesus' life. It's referred to as Palm Sunday. That's when he comes into Jerusalem. From here to the crucifixion of Jesus is about four days. So as you're reading the book of Matthew, you can look at that from from verse or from chapter 21 up to the crucifixion of Christ is about is about a four day period of time and so all of this uh, that we're what we're about to read is is taking part in Jerusalem kind of in that last that last few days of Jesus life as he is kind of making his last appeal to the Pharisees uh, that are that are there in Jerusalem now as Jesus would often do he would speak in parables and really from about Matthew chapter 13 forward Jesus uh, speaks and teaches in parables because really the Pharisees from that point had made up their mind concerning him and uh, so uh, that Jesus is speaking to them in parables and that's what we find going on here as we begin in verse 1 Matthew 22 verse 1 and Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said the kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come again he sent forth other servants saying tell them that were bidden behold I have prepared my dinner my oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready come unto the marriage but they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage or excuse me, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a garment? And he was speechless. And he said to the king, then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away, and cast him in outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now I'm going to stop reading here in verse 14. We, we really want to uh, kind of get down to, we're going to work our way through the entire parable, but we want to call, come kind of to this last statement, because this is really the entire point that Jesus is trying to make, that there are many that are going to be called, but there are a few that are going to be chosen or saved, okay? So while there's a lot of people, he really divides them into two groups. There are all those that are called, which really is all men, and then those that are chosen are those that are saved. And so these two groups. And uh, the emphasis, a lot of times you look at the parables, and what Jesus is trying to get across, if, if we're not careful, we try to study these parables where we look at every single detail and kind of try to fit it in. And sometimes if, if we're not careful, we're trying to put together a, a, a puzzle. And you know how you, you, you put together a puzzle and sometimes it looks like a piece fits and you almost want to shove it in there, you know. You can't just shove it. In other words, you've got to let it fit where it, where it fits. Don't me, try to make it fit somewhere. That's, you know, reading the, the Bible with preconceived notions. We, we can't do that. We've got to allow it to fall into the place where it properly fits and not try to force it into a specific place. Often we try to do that with the parables. We try to force it. What we need to do sometimes when we read these parables is take a step back and look at them a little bit differently. Look at them kind of from a distance 
and, and allow these things to fall into their own places. Say, what, okay, what's the main point that Jesus is trying to get across and then work from there, okay? And so what really Jesus, the main point is that few, many are called, but, but few are chosen. There are a lot that receive the invitation, but there are not many, very many that accept the invitation. That's the point. And so going back for a moment and to uh, kind of what's taken place in the past or in this 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 you know before this because jesus is kind of catch the context jesus is in the same scenario he's speaking to the pharisees this is maybe the first this is the second day maybe of as jesus is coming to jerusalem and he's speaking to the pharisees and, and what he's told them is that you know there's there's uh consider this kind of that a, a, a father has two sons and he tells these two sons to go work in, in my vineyard. And so he, he gives them this, this command, you go work in the vineyard. And one son says, no, I'm not going to work. And then he ends up repenting and uh, going and, and going on and, and doing what his father's asking him to do. And the other one says, okay, I'll go work for you, but just don't go do it. And he says, which one has done the will of the father? Well, it's the one that's repented. And, and what Jesus is showing is really automatically, regardless of what they say, they're both in a position where they, they haven't done what God's asked. And so the one that's done properly at least is the one who has repented and then gone from that point forward. And so he's showing the need of repentance there. And then he goes on to make this statement in verse 31. He says, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. And so what Jesus is emphasizing, at least in part of this parable, is that the people that you think are going to be saved are not the ones that are going to be saved. The people that you believe to be a part of the kingdom of God are really not the ones that are a part of the kingdom at all. And the kingdom is actually made up of people who you would never have imagined to be the case. And so Jesus is bringing an emphasis on that. And so he begins in verse 2 with the idea of the kingdom of heaven. And so this is the uh, kingdom of heaven. It's God's control from, from heaven upon the earth, okay? So God's kingdom upon the earth, okay? And so how you be a part of the kingdom of heaven? Well, there's only one way, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And so we'll see that as Jesus is presenting that. And so he's likening the kingdom of heaven, okay? So let me describe the kingdom of heaven. There's obviously a lot of things that the Pharisees missed about the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus straightens them out concerning that. And so in chapter 13, you see that concerning the parables, that the kingdom of heaven parables often revealing the mysteries of what people thought were different about the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is here showing us one thing about the kingdom that's different than what a lot of people have thought before. And so what he is, he says, well, there's a certain king that made a marriage for his son, okay? A certain king made a marriage for his son. And, and what he did was he, he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. Okay, the word bidden here, this is, we want to start here. The word bidden is the same word in verse 14 for the word called, okay? So the idea is that the invitation has gone out, and now it's time to tell them, okay, it's time to come in. The, the day has come, you need to come into the wedding, okay? And so you've already received the invitation, You've already been, been given that. The invitation is coming. That's the idea of bidding. It's the invitation is, is gone out, and those that are ready, go bring them into the wedding. And, and so the, the word here is called. Now, I want to give you a few scriptures where this exact same word is used. Romans chapter 1 is one place that it is used. I'm, if you'll turn there, you can hold your place here because, of course, we're going to come back to this parable. So mark it some way so that you can turn back to it. And then look at Romans chapter 1 for a moment. Romans chapter 1. And so in the, the very first verse of Romans chapter 1, it tells us Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. The word called here is the same idea as bidden. 
In other words, that, that Paul wasn't just an apostle on his own making or his own bearing, but he was called to it. He was called by God. He was given the invitation of God to come into this position. He was bidden to this invitation, or, or rather to this position. I heard a man one day make the statement concerning preachers. Now, of course, there are no more apostles because of one of the requirements and the qualifications of an apostle is that the man must have seen Christ as uh, in his resurrected state, okay? And obviously, there's none of, no one left that, that has met that qualification, so there's no more apostles. Paul gives us those. But there are, of course, there are preachers and teachers left in the church of God. And so, how does a man be a preacher? Well, the first requirement is that he be bidden of God, okay? And so, a man made the statement about being a preacher. He said, if you have chosen to be a preacher, and you can quit being a preacher, then go ahead and do it. In other words, you should. If you can quit, you should quit, because you were never called because a man who is truly called to the ministry cannot quit the ministry. It's not, it's not that easy. It's not that simple. You can't just stop preaching because God's called you to that place. Uh, and, and I believe this with all my heart, with what God has shown me and done with me in my life. I'll give you a personal experience concerning that that will illustrate what the Scripture bears out. Uh, my mother-in-law went and saw Crystal's grandmother the other day. She uh, has Alzheimer's and she has problems with her memory. And she asked uh, Miss Bridget, she said, uh, she said, is Trent still preaching? And Crystal's mother, Miss Bridget, she said, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's still, he ain't quit, you know. And I said, I could, I could quit. That's what I was telling her. I could quit. I said, but if I quit, Crystal would be a widow. In other words, if I tried to quit preaching, God would kill me. That's not something I say just to be funny or amusing. I believe that with all my heart. It's not something that God has, this is what God has chosen for me to do. And, and I have no choice but to do this. This is what he's given me. Okay, same idea of the word calling here. But I want you to go back to verse 6. Verse 6. In Romans 1, verse 6, he said, Among whom are ye also the, what? The called of Jesus Christ, that all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. It's the same word. It's called. They're, they're invited. In other words, not like the, the calling upon the man of God is, is very similar to, to the calling to be saved. And we're, you know, it's a situation where the man who is to be the pastor, the preacher is called, and God may not give him the choice, so to speak, as we might say. In other words, it, it's do this, it's calling for your life. Well, this is more of the invitation, yet they're very similar. And so one man asked me, what is it like to be called to preach? And the first thing that I asked him, I said, well, how do you know that you're saved? Because the two are so similar that that's the first thing you better make sure of if you feel like the Lord is calling you to preach is that you actually know whether or not you're truly saved. Because they're invitations. And they're very similar invitations. But the invitation that uh, is, of course, called to being called here to trust the Lord Jesus Christ can be refused and often, uh, unfortunately, is refused. And so the point that I'm trying to make is that the idea of being bidden to the wedding that Jesus has given here is the idea of an invitation. It's the idea of being invited to this thing, invited here, that God has called this person, He's drawing this person to this place to come into this wedding. And so God is, uh, Christ is making it uh, and emphasizing the point that these have been bidden into the wedding. Okay? So I think the next question that we have to ask is, who is it that's, who is it that's being bidden? Well, he, he tells us here in verse 4, he says, And again, he, he sent forth servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatlings are killed. And he goes on and he said, They made light of it, these, these people that were bidden. 
I think to begin with, who Jesus is speaking about specifically, is he's speaking about the nation of Israel. Because God had established the kingdom of heaven with the nation of Israel. I often talk about them being God's chosen people. In other words, that the, the kingdom in its physical state was with the nation of Israel. It was with these particular people. Now, in no way does that mean that only they received the invitation and there was not an invitation given to anyone else. Okay? In other words, that when you read the Old Testament or you read the fact that the nation of Israel was the ones who, through, the, the, through which the invitation came, doesn't mean that in the Old Testament the Gentiles did not receive any invitation, neither were bidden to, say, be, to be saved or to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, That's not at all what the Scripture says. Let me give you some examples of that. When Abraham was uh, twice, two times in the life of Abraham, did he come into a particular situation where his life was threatened, or at least he thought it was, because of his wife, Sarah, okay? And so evidently it was the case that Sarah, even in her age, was a beautiful woman, and that he thought because of her looks that in the place where they were going that he was going to be killed and they would take her. And so he told Sarah to lie. You tell them that you're my sister, and at least they'll preserve my life, and they'll save my life, and, and won't kill me uh, when they take you, okay? That happened twice, both times. He was put in the same situation, once in Egypt, once before the king of Abimelech, and both times he made the statement that I didn't believe, surely, I didn't believe the fear of God was in this place. In other words, there was a place outside of Abraham, there was a place where other people were fearing the God of Abraham. Okay? These people were not Jews. In fact, they weren't even descendants of Abraham. When Jonah was told to go preach to the Ninevites, who were they? Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, they were Gentiles. And yet 120,000 of them were saved in the Old Testament. In fact, you can read the prophet Nahum. And Nahum is the, the, the begins the book of Nahum with the burden of Nineveh, which was written to the Ninevites about 100, 150 years after Jonah had went and preached. In other words, that God is still saving the Gentiles. God is still bidding them to the invitation. But he's emphasizing the fact that he has chosen separately these people to distribute his invitation. He's chosen these people specifically to invite to the wedding, and they've refused it. Okay? When you look through the, nat the nation of Israel, and we ask, why did God even go through the process of that? What we see in the Old Testament through the nation of Israel is the nature of mankind. And God bears record in the old covenant. He points out the nature of mankind. Why? That we would all, the whole world, would become guilty before God. And so the whole world, through Israel, really were bidden. So what he's doing here is he's making reference to the fact that what Paul says in Romans chapter 11 that God has, by the Gentiles, provoked Israel to jealousy. And that through having mercy upon the Gentiles, that they would become jealous and God would have mercy upon them. You can go back and read that at the end of Romans chapter 11. And he says, "How oh, the depth, the riches, both of the, the knowledge, the wisdom of God. And that kind of goes into song there about how wonderful and brilliant God is concerning his plan. In other words, God hadn't been... Uh, really uh, partial to anybody. But really every man has been bidden, and every man will be bidden to the wedding. And so the scripture speaks of uh, Jesus Christ, 
who is the light of the world, the same light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And so every man will be bidden to the wedding. Every man will be invited. Every man will receive that invitation. And that's why Jesus uses the word many as an emphasis, that there are great numbers that are going to be invited. Okay, Many will be invited to the wedding. In fact, all men will be and receive that invitation. Okay, But few will be chosen. And we're going to get to that point here. In a few moments. Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist, which is the last prophet, speaks of this. And he's, he makes a statement that he, 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 in his teaching of repentance, that he tells the, 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 the scribes, the Pharisees, come to his baptism and kind of poking fun at him, saying, why don't you baptize us? And he says, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. And say not that we have our fathers to Abraham. In other words, we're okay like we are. We're going to get into the wedding just like we are because we've lived a good life and we're the, we're the children of Abraham. Okay? And he says, no, you bring forth fruit and meat for repentance. Repentance. What Jesus has already been teaching about. Repentance. In other words, the people that you think are going are not going. And really the publicans and the harlots are going to get into the in there before you will. Why? Because they received the invitation. They received the invitation. And so he, John the Baptist says in Matthew chapter 3, he says, Lord, the, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. In other words, it's time to decide. And either God's going to cut the tree down and turn to the Gentiles. Or either y'all going to do what you're supposed to do. Of course they didn't. And uh, he turns to the Gentiles, and we see that. And Jesus is laying all this out for us in this parable. In verse 6, he says, And the remnant took his servants, these that have come to bid them to the wedding. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed these murderers and burned up their city. Now, what did he say? Well, where did this happen? Well, this happened from Nebuchadnezzar to Titus, which is about 70 A.D. You're covering about 500, 600 year span of time. Remember that this parable is really is 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 spanning a, a great gasp of time, and so Jesus has given us this this parable, this this short uh, example to cover a uh, two, three, four thousand year period of time. Okay. And so he, sent, he says he sent his armies and destroyed the murderers. And he turned and he told his servants, go into the highways, the byways. Verse 8, then said he uh, to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden, the ones that I invited, they didn't, they're not worthy to come. They didn't see fit that they wanted to come. They refused the invitation. He says, so go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. You tell them to come in. Okay. So verse 10, he says, So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found. Read this. For emphasis sake, please read with me. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both what? Good and bad. Both good and bad. What does that mean? Why did Jesus let us know that when these people come into the wedding, that when if you were to be a fly on the wall, so to speak, and you looking over all of the guests that are in this wedding now, that you would take note of the fact that there were some people by our standards, now it's important to understand that what Jesus is speaking is that this is based upon the standard of the Pharisees, that there would be a group of people that, that they would be have lived a really good life, but there would also be these guests in the wedding that they're not. They're not good people. They've lived, in other words, they've lived bad lives. And so the reason that Jesus is doing this and is emphasizing this point is to establish the idea with us and with the Pharisees that the criteria for entering into the kingdom of heaven is not good or bad life. Okay? Jesus is emphasizing that. Why is that important? Because if you speak to anybody that doesn't have a proper knowledge of the Scripture and you ask them, how do you go to heaven? They'll tell you, well, if you live good enough, if you live a good enough life, then you can 
be saved. And you know, you can, you, if the good outweighs the bad, that's the notion of the world. If you live a good enough, and then, you know, maybe if you've done enough good things, or you've given enough stuff away. And How many of y'all remember a Christmas carol? That's the whole point of the Christmas carol. The Scrooge has lived an awful life, right? Well, what does he do at the end of the show? Well, he takes all the fortune that he's had and gained all his life, and he gives it away, and he starts giving it. Why? So that maybe he can take away some of the links in this chain, okay, that he's got to carry now for all eternity, which is partner Bob Marley has warned him about. The whole point of it is you've got to better do some good now while you've got time so that you can lessen your sentence in eternity. But that's not, that's the whole point, that's the whole idea that the world thinks is that the criteria for entering into this is whether you've been good or bad. You know, if you're good then you can get in, but if you're bad, no, you're not in. Well, what Jesus is saying is actually the guests of this wedding are both good and bad. In other words, there's going to be some harlots there. There's going to be some publicans there. There's going to be some murderers and some adulterers and some some thieves and all of this that that are going to be there. Some that by your standard have really bad lives. Why? Because really our standard is flawed. And so the first thing that Jesus does is emphasize that what's going to happen in judgment is not going to be judged by good or bad life. Okay, so then you say, well, okay, how are then people going to be allowed to come into the wedding? What is the judgment based upon whether or not they get to be in the wedding? Well, first, whether or not they've received the invitation. Whether they've accepted the invitation to come. But then there is one man, and again, it's important to it's important to note it says there's gonna be one day when the rapture takes place and God calls his people out, as there's gonna be one person that goes up and he don't have a wedding garment and Jesus goes ahead and casts him in hell at that particular time. That's not even the point. That's not what Jesus is trying to say. He's trying to emphasize the fact that uh, uh, there was a person and the criteria for judgment for a person to be in this wedding was whether or not they had a garment. Okay? So the king comes through and begins to admire the guests of this wedding. Some good, some bad. And he, as he's looking over these guests, Scripture says that he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. Okay? So what is that? What does that tell us? What, what, are, what are we supposed to know about this wedding garment? Our righteousness is often referred to as garments. We mentioned, I think we mentioned this fact Wednesday night, if I'm not mistaken. So all throughout the scripture we, we see righteousness on display in the Bible as garments. Okay? That's why the Bible describes the righteousness of man as filthy rags. If a man walks up in this wedding with filthy rags on, he's not appropriately dressed for this wedding. One of my favorite songs in the Songs of Faith book is number 52. And it says that they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And what it's written from one of the seven uh, church letters I don't remember exactly which one. Maybe it was Philadelphia. I'd have to go back and look. But the point that Jesus is emphasizing is that if they overcome, in other words, if they are saved, then I'm going to allow them to walk with me in white. What does he mean? Why is white emphasized? Why would we wear a robe of white? The robe of white is a spotless robe that's purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. When, when James makes the statement about pure religion or pure worship of God, that you would do those things you're supposed to do, in other words, visiting this fatherless, uh, the, the, the orphans and the, the fatherless and the widows, and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's the idea. It's not that you wouldn't be seen in the world. It's to, to not be, have spotted garments by the world. And so he's saying here that, okay, there's one man that doesn't have a wedding garment. He's come here robed in his own righteousness. You take him out and bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. But all of these others that are robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith, 
they can stay because they have the garment on. They have been covered. If you want to reference scripture, you can put Romans chapter 4, verse 4. Abraham believed God and it was counted, counted unto him for righteousness. Counted unto him for righteousness. In other words, he didn't earn the robe. He was given the robe by the blood of Jesus, by accepting the sacrificial offering. You see, today God is, is bidding people to come to this wedding. The wedding's coming, and he's bidding men to come. You remember, and we go on Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gives another one very similar about, about five foolish virgins and five wise virgins. And the difference, the whole difference between whether they were foolish or whether they were wise, every, every other thing in the parable is exactly the same. Even to the point that all ten of them fell asleep at the end. But five of them had oil. And five of them did not. Five of them had the Spirit of God which denoted their uh, sanctification and their regeneration by the Spirit of God. They were saved. And five did not. And five were allowed to go in to the wedding. And five were not. Why? Jesus. The point of judgment, the difference of judgment is Jesus. And, and Christ is emphasizing this. That it's not going to be judged like you think. It's not going to be judged on good and bad. It's not going to be ju judged on whether men's lives have been this or that. It's going to be judged on Jesus. Do you know Jesus or not? Do you know Jesus or not? And this man didn't have a wedding garment. He said, how comest thou into this? This is amazing to me. Said, how comest, verse 12, he said, And he saith unto him, Friend, how comest thou in, in hither not having a wedding garment? And notice this man, he's asking him here. Now the king is asking him, this is representing God looking at a man in judgment and judging him. Okay, Why did you come in here without a garment? In other words, why did you not trust the Lord Jesus Christ? And the scripture says that this man was speechless. There was no defense that he had for himself. And as you ask people about judgment and what are you going to say to God or what are you going to stand before him with, and people often have plenty to say and plenty to tell you about what they're going to do and the excuses they'll have in judgment one day. I'm going to tell you what men will say before God one day if they have not trusted Jesus Christ. Not a word. They'll be speechless. Why? Because God will have so much evidence and so much that He brings in front of you to show you of your opportunities to be saved and everything that was done for you to trust the Lord Jesus Christ that there will be no excuse and there will be nothing that can be said. Men will be speechless before God on that day. I'll tell you, there's a lot of people, atheists, in the world that don't believe God. What an atheist is, an atheist is a person that don't believe there is a God. But the Bible don't believe in atheist. In other words, the Bible says that while they knew God, they glorified him not as God. In other words, there is not a man who doesn't know God and understand that there is a God. It's just that while they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became vain in their imaginations. In other words, they just wanted to do their own thing and live their own life. And so they refused the invitation. They rejected the invitation and the bidding, the calling that God had given them to be saved. They rejected it. And so then Jesus uses these words in Matthew 22, back down in the end of this parable. He said, many are called. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now, a lot of people want to use this idea to make the statement that God picks and chooses who it is that gets saved, and that's not at all what this means. For just a moment, I want to tell you, predestination in the Bible is, is it's, it's a proper thing. It's true, but you've got to understand it, okay? You've got to understand what the Bible is telling you. Turn to Romans chapter 16 really quick. I mentioned this verse Wednesday night. Y'all remember Rufus.
Rufus was also chosen. Rufus, this is Romans 16, verse 13. This is why so many people fail at Calvinistic doctrine. And by the way, Calvinistic doctrine is heresy. It's awful. And any person that believes that somebody's going to be picked to be saved because God picked them, and some person's not going to be picked to save because God didn't pick them, that's, that, that's, that's garbage. That's, not, that's anti-scripture altogether. All men are called. The difference in whether you get in the wedding or not is what you do about the invitation. It's up to you. It's not up to God. Let me show you. Romans 16, verse 13. Paul says, salute Rufus. And Rufus was chosen. How was Rufus chosen? He was chosen in the Lord, right? Three words after the word chosen. Chosen in the Lord, okay? Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Turn there real quick. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4. According as he hath chosen us. How? In him. When? From the foundation of the world. What does that mean? That means that God gave men a choice and, and God knew that sin would come into the world and something had to be done with sin if He was going to dwell with man for all eternity. And so what's going to be done with sin? Well, let's see, it, it, it's, it's, who did God choose? God chose somebody. Who did God choose? God chose Jesus. Because Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus was completely sinless. God chose Jesus and everybody in Jesus will be saved. So who did God choose from the foundation of the world? He chose Jesus. And so think about it of the ark of Moses. And God says, okay, here's the problem. Men are sinners and I'm going to have to destroy the world and begin all over again. But I, there, there's some that are righteous and some that are, that are, okay, how are we going to make this decision? What's the judgment on? So what we're going to do is we're going to build an ark. And whoever gets in the ark gets saved. And whoever don't get in the ark don't get saved. Just that simple. And so what did Noah do? Noah bid people come into the ark. Come into the ark. It's going to rain. It's going to flood. Come into the ark. Jesus is the ark of God. And men have been bidden, come into the ark. And everyone who comes into Jesus is chosen. And we've been chosen in Him. What does that mean? That means you trust Jesus or you're cast into outer darkness. You trust Jesus or it's hell. There is no other judgment. There is no other in between. There's no, no other answer. It's Christ or hell. And today you've received the invitation. If God is bidding you to come, if God is bidding you, you trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God chose Jesus. Now this is, I, I love this part. Often compared to a marriage. What does it mean to be in Christ? It's all, through the Old, it's all through the New Testament. It's one of the keys to the New Testament. In Christ. In Jesus Christ. In fact, as you read the... Underline it in your Bible as you read the New Testament. You'll find it all in there. Y'all remember in the first chapter of Job and God told... God told the devil that you can have everything that Job has. But there's one thing you cannot touch. And what was that? His body. And the devil took every single thing that the devil had except one other person. And who was that? His wife. Why? Because she and Job were one flesh. Us and Christ are one flesh. And the devil has no legal right to us because we are the body of Christ. We are married to him, espoused to be married to him. And come into the wedding. Come into the wedding. Come into Jesus. Be married. 
have eternal life. Today the invitation has been given. You have been bidden to come. And today receive the invitation. I was talking to my older brother just the other day. And he was telling me about some things. And as he built his house. And maybe a way or two that it didn't turn out exactly like he wanted. And a way that he wanted to change it. And kind of do things a little bit different. And he said I want to take some cypress. And put it in a specific gable and all of that. I said, I, said, That'll be, I said it'll look good. I said it'll be real good firewood. Because one day it's going to burn. I said, just remember that. We remind that. We remind each other of things all the time. He'll tell me the same thing. I said, just remember that. And he said, I know it. He said, it ain't going to be long. And he said, all, everything I got is just going to burn up. It keeps us focused on what's important. And it's not what we have here. It's what we have there. That's what's important. Today, Christ is the ark. And soon this world will be destroyed by fire. And God's going to bring about, and, and, and it's going to be a wedding. And you'll be bidden to that. You're being bidden now. And you can come in. But do you have a wedding garment? Have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you received Christ that you could have his righteousness? And by his righteousness only, through faith, you could have eternal life. While we have a verse of a song.